It's fantastic to have you all with us. Thank you. My name's uh, Ben Hart uh, from the Donkey Sanctuary, and I'm just going to facilitate this evening of these amazing experts that have, have gathered to give us this uh, webinar on modern animal traction and the current situation, challenges, and opportunities. We've got uh, Joao from Portugal, and Hi, ben. Earhart's in Germany, and Pitt is in Belgium. Luxembourg. Luxembourg. So let me introduce Pitt. We'll get started. We're going to, each of the panelists has got a little bit of an area that they want to talk to you uh, tonight. And um, then we're going to have a little bit of a general discussion and some of your questions and uh, we'll see if we can answer those. So do get those in as we go through. Now, Pitt has been working uh, with draft horses for, as a breeder and user of working horses for about 30 years. Um, in 1993, he became the secretary and then chairman of the Luxembourg Heavy Horse Breeding Association uh, and a board member of uh, the European Working Horse Network. Um, so first as chairman and being currently the vice president. So he's written technical press, contributed to conferences, training courses on the use of modern um, working horses. He's an advisor to Nature and Forestry Administration and Luxembourg government and a proud owner of two Zamorino Lorenz donkeys. There's my Portuguese coming in. I hope that was okay for you. Um, Pip, okay. Uh, let's get started. And you're going you're gonna to kick us off, um, I think, looking at um, the, the sort of current um, situation. Yes, that's it. Uh, okay. First of all, I, I would like to thank you, Ben, and the Donkey Sanctuary for giving us the opportunity to present the uh, draft animal use in Europe. Uh, I shall uh, mostly rely on commented pictures, as they often show more than you can say in a few words. So the beginning in the 1990s, uh, many, but not all, the young enthusiasts that showed a new interest in work with horses in the 1990s had an urban background and may be considered as representatives of the 68th generation. Their inspiration came from different sources. In the 1990s, slogans like uh, small is beautiful or back to the countryside were very popular and the extremely well illustrated books of the Englishman John Seymour on self-sufficiency and small farming, uh, for instance, had a huge response all over Europe in the 1970s and later on. A second uh, inspiration, a second source of inspiration, uh, of course, the new enthusiasts uh, tried to meet with professional people that still worked with horses on a daily basis, like horse loggers, for instance. This way, a kind of coalition is emerging between young intellectuals and people, let's say, with dirty fingernails, often leading to a long-lasting cooperation and a deep friendship. Another source of inspiration was the use of animal traction in developing countries. Different networks and organizations in these countries focused on the subject, often supported by their government and by people and institutions in Europe. Jean Nolte's book in, on modern machinery, published in 1986, and the books and articles of Paul Starkey on different aspects of animal traction are good examples. The same as the draft animal news published by Anne Pearson from the University of Edinburgh since 1983. And then there was uh, finally the word of the Amish people in the United States. They had and still have an enormous influence on the work with horses and animals in Europe, as they do not allow to the use of internal combustion engines for moving vehicles and machines. They have developed a comprehensive technology based on horsepower. Erhard Schroll will certainly come back to this subject later on. Beyond the problem of procuring a horse that is able to work, 
one of the main challenges for turning your dream into reality is the harness. Finding second-hand harness that is still in good shape is already quite difficult, but finding a good one that fits your horse is nearly impossible. On the other hand, a new harness designed especially for your horse is really expensive and unattainable for most of the beginners. Then and, uh, one of the reasons why many beginners started their working horse experience with logging is the fact that they did not need to own the forests where they worked and their horse and its harness were all they needed. When starting to work in agriculture or gardening, the implement issue made things a lot more complicated as older used items were mostly worn out and new ones were not available. These challenges increased the need to get in touch with other like-minded people and the demand for all kinds of information on the different aspects of work with horses. This led to the cre creation of many magazines and newsletters in different countries. One of the first was the Heavy Horse World that started in the UK in 1987. The Starke Pferde, published in Germany by Erhard Scholl, started in 1996. And Scandinavia was involved from the very beginning. The Swedish Moderna Hestkrafter, meaning modern horsepower, started in 1997. And the Norwegian Arbeitshesten, meaning working horses, already started in 1991. France also was very active publishing books and magazines like Sabot, meaning hoofs, available since 1996. Poland also has a working horse organization. Its newsletter called Working Horses is published since 2003. In 1995, <clears throat> Charlie Pinney from England launched the idea to create an international organization of individuals interested in work with horses. The attempt failed because it was nearly impossible to communicate with so many different people speaking different languages. As a consequence, the second attempt in 2003 tried successfully to bring together associations instead of individuals. We started with seven founding members in 2003, and we now have 21 <coughs> associations based in 14 uh, European countries. According to its constitution, FACTU is supposed to encourage cooperation between European working horse organizations represent these organizations on all levels, promote and protect their common interests, help preserving the European draft animal heritage, promote sound working practices with regard to the humans involved, the animals and the environment. Within the last 30 years, the overall perception of animal traction slowly changed. Work with animals was for a long time considered as nostalgic, inefficient, static, and obsolete. In some respects, it is now seen as modern, eco-friendly, and a sustainable option. Around 1990, it was hard to find professional horse people accepting a young person as a trainee, so many beginners had problems to start in a job that may look quite easy at a first glance. In fact, a lot of experience and know-how is requested if you want to work in a secure and economically viable way. Today, many training opportunities are offered by skilled people and by organizations. In some countries, apprenticeships for future horsemen and horsewomen are even offered by agricultural schools and institutions. As we shall see later on, significant progress has been made regarding modern equipment for all kinds of work relying on draft animals. In some countries, a financial contribution is granted by the government 
in order to support events, publications and activities intended to promote the use of working horses where it makes sense. The slide shows a booklet on walking, working horses published by the National Forestry Administration in Luxembourg in 2005 and another one published with the help of the German Ministry for Environment in 2009. They both show what working horses can be used for in different sectors like forestry, agriculture, nature conservation, urban surroundings and tourism. Technical skilled individuals, draft animal associations as well as technical institutions and agricultural departments in universities show a new interest in research on issues linked to the use of working equids. The slide shows a diagram illustrating the draft forces used during a pulling effort. And on the right side, it shows the different areas of pressure on the horse's shoulder on different colors during work. Other research is focused, for instance, on so soil compaction issues caused by horses compared to tractors or the economic outcomes of holdings based on draft animal power. The work in forestry is not limited to traditional logging, but often relies on combined techniques and newly developed equipment. The picture on the left shows horses that bring logs from both sides to feed the cable logging installation in difficult terrain. And bracken bashing with horses, for instance, shown in the left picture is becoming more and more popular. Agriculture using animal traction is a big challenge, even if you limit yourself to market gardening and if you are embedded in a regional or local market with regular and constant demands coming from customers that agree to pay fair prices for seasonal products. Sometimes this option is given in so-called solidarity-based agriculture. The use of horses in vineyards is particularly po popular in France. It has been very remarkably increasing over the last years, mainly on lands cultivated according to bio or biodynamic methods. The biological activity rate of the soils is increased by over 40% if tractors are replaced by horses due to the reduction of soil compaction and the elimination of the vibrations caused by the tractor engine. It seems that more than 300 French cities and towns regularly or occasionally rely on horses for a whole range of different services needed in urban surroundings lawn mowing, watering plants, collecting different kinds of waste, and even transporting school children. In 2003, a national network for these towns was created. Taking tourists for a carriage ride through picturesque towns has a long tradition in many European cities and towns. For transporting larger groups of people, the service providers nowadays often rely on covered wagons drawn by a pair of heavy draft horses. Maybe it should be pointed out that the situation regarding the use of working horses is a different one in Eastern Europe. Romania certainly is the most interesting example. According to the average of available data, there are more than 700,000 horses in this country most of them being used in agriculture, in forestry and transport. One of the reasons is the fact that the vast majority of the four million Romanian farmers are quite old and own less than one hectare or two and a half acres. An unstoppable trend to very large agricultural holdings and to industrialized forestry relying on mechanization and often on foreign investments and land grabbing is to be seen, except for mountainous and remote regions. The government shows no interest at all in working horses. There is even a ban 
for horse-drawn vehicles on national roads, meaning most of the roads, although it is not strictly enforced everywhere. The use of working animals certainly makes sense in some sectors, but basically it does not fit into the current economic system. Beyond the still existing lack of skilled people, cheap modern equipment and funding, there are some major challenges. Let me give you just two examples. In regions where small farming could offer good conditions for animal traction, horses are often replaced by small two-wheel tractors. In urban surroundings, electric vehicles represent a strong competition to draft horses. Another challenge is given by campaigns of fundamentalist animal rights activists asking to ban the use of working animals. To end uh, my presentation, I wanted to point out a few indicators for a favorable uh, context. With there is a general awareness for energy issues now, renewables, ecological alternatives, climate change, and so on. Traditional options are getting more attention. For, for example, firewood for heating, homeopathic medicine, urban gardening, local markets, direct sales, slow tourism, and so on. Small farming is recognized as being a fundamental contribution to feeding the world. Animal attraction takes profit from an increasing visibility. Working horses are to be seen in towns and at many national and international forestry shows. And finally, well-organized work with horses shows to be economically viable in forestry, market gardening, vineyards, and urban surroundings. Thank you. Thank you, Pitt. That, that's an amazing um, roundup of just there's such a vast interest and opportunity. And, and I was wondering whether you thought that, that Equipower was really could be considered a, a sustainable energy source. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting question. In fact, uh, this question includes two questions. Of course, energy coming from self-reproducing animals fed on renewable feedstuff is to be considered as a renewable energy source. But the second question is, can animal power be considered as a sustainable energy source in the same way as wind, water, sunshine, and biomass? The answer is yes, only if you imagine <coughs> huge industrial power plants where thousands or more horses produce electricity by walking in modern treadmill items in a rotating system over 24 hours a day. Their energy is converted into electricity and this way it may be equivalent to the other sustainable energy sources. Under current conditions, animal power cannot be stored distributed and sold with the help of existing technical systems. Animal power simply does not fit into our economical frame based on large investments, big business and dependency of the customers. Before building the power plants for animal energy, we could possibly make a first tr trial with the human energy spoiled in the existing power plants called fitness centers. I like that. We'll just, we'll just, yeah, wire up everybody's uh, gym machinery and see how much electricity we can uh, create. I like that. That's a great idea. But, but that's fantastic. And I think that really builds uh, nicely to introduce to your um, Erhard, who um, in 1985 founded his own forest service company, specializing in logging and other services with working horses. Um, and he did that for 16 years before he had to leave the forest and then started, ended up starting as a volunteer in a horse magazine, ended up publishing one of those leading horse magazines uh, since 2000. Um, and so he's been heavily involved in all of this, including starting up as the co-founder of um, 
one of Europe's uh, leading um, horse uh, meetings and fairs focused on modern use of work in equids. And just a because he's got a bit of spare time. He's also a, a full-time farmer and uh, working on the farm with his sheep and, and the crops. And he's responsible for the tractor work and working with horses on, on the grassland. And, and just in between that, he does uh, offers courses for working horses as, as a trainer for more than 20 years. So I think it's amazing to have you here. At our, and um, you're going to talk to us about the um, current situation and um, that sort of aspect uh, in Europe at the moment. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Ben, for your introduction, and thank you very much for having invited me. And a good evening all together. Um, I try to start my presentation. I hope it works. Uh, well, can you see the yeah. screen? Yeah, it's working. It's working. Okay, fine. Thank you. Um, well. I'd like to give you um, a very short um, review on my own experience with uh, working horses. My first contact with the horse work was in the age of 24 when I was working in a social project dealing with making and selling firewood. It was the age of the Waldsterben and the protection of nature and environment moved my generation. So we were searching for an alternative to the tractor that was obviously damaging the bark and the roots of the trees and the forest soil in generally. Finally, we found the horse, a perfect solution. Later, I began a short education as a horse logger in a small family-run business that was one of the very few who had continuously used horses for generations. When I moved from there, I took two horses with me and founded in 1985 my own forestry company offering logging and other services with horses. At that time, it was quite easy to start such an operation because the regulations were low and you didn't need any official uh, certification. You only have to fulfill the animal welfare requirements which were controlled by the local vet office. As long as you did your work well, you normally hadn't any problems to get a new job. In order to be able to realize a good job, you need good and suitable horses. Above all, they must be healthy, must have a good character, and must be old enough at minimum four years. I personally have no preferences concerning the breed and try to support the local breed in the area where I live. Being at home in West Germany now, I use and I breed Rhenish German cold blood that belongs to the rare breeds on the red list. What I prefer are horses uh, that are not too big, around about 16 and a half hands, and not heavier than 900 kilogram, with sure footing and a good walk. Professional Horse logging often means working five or six days a week for six to seven hours a day. Based on mutual trust, this regular work can create an outstanding intensive relationship between human and animal. And if the chemistry is right, you can achieve a level of working together and a performance that is sheer unbelievable. For me, it is the most beautiful work I've ever done in my life. As the leader and owner, you are always responsible for the safety and health of the horse. You have to care for well-suited and fitted harness and for appropriate equipment. For heavy, horse, uh, for heavy work in the forest, for example, I generally use color harness because in my experience, it's much more horse-friendly than a breast color. Having good and well-trained horse, it was obvious for me to use them for farm work as well. But my first attempts in the 1980s were very, very frustrating. At that time, only traditional horse-drawn implements were available, often 60, 70, or 80, or more years old, rusty, and worn out. 
even if you had luck to find one in good condition, you had serious problems at the latest when a part of it got broken because spare parts were not available. That means, especially at harvest time, to stop work and to fall back to the tractor. What I have learned in these times was working with horses in the forest is feasible and profitable, but professional, serious work on the farm doesn't work. That's just a hobby. It was 1996 when I was involved in organizing and preparing a horse event with show displays, competitions, and working demonstrations in the woods and in the fields. We named Pferde Stark. And I was responsible for managing the working demonstrations. We had a great success and decided to repeat the event one year later again with more focuses on the modern use of working horses. We invited horse people from other European countries, among them Pete Schlechter, who is in our round uh, today, and many others who six, year six years later founded the factory. For example, the later Charlie Pinney from the UK, who was one of the first who presented new manufactured equipment in form of his self-created Pinto cards and power cards. The event was even noticed by the international press. From 1997 on, Pferdestark was installed regularly every other year until today and has become the most important meeting point for working horse enthusiasts and equipment producers in Europe. A melting pot for new ideas and a source for motivation. The next date will be on the last weekend in August 2021. You are welcome to visit. <laughs> In the same year, 1997, I started publishing the working horse magazine Starke Pferde on a volunteer base. The more I was forced to reduce my activities in the forest by health reasons, the more time I spent for making the magazine. In 2000, I turned my hobby into my profession and founded an own published company. And this was obviously a really good decision. The print run increased continuously up to 18,000 today. And despite it is written in German, it is currently sent to subscribers in 25 different countries worldwide. In 2000, I visited the Horse Progress Days in the United States for the first time. It is the greatest and most important fair for modern horse-drawn equipment in the world. Never in my life before I had seen so many horses at work in different hitches and such a variety of brand new machines. It was really fantastic. At this trip, I had also the chance to meet Amish farmers in Lancaster County and the opportunity to see and to learn how they are farming. And that was really eye-opened. For the very first time in my life, I've seen really horse farming life and in color and in the plurality and dimension I couldn't imagine before. It was, uh, it was really, yeah, perfect. I was, I was really fascinated. And I saw it apparently works. I flew home not only with an exciting report for my magazine in the pocket and a new American harness in the baggage, but also high motivated to restart my interrupted farm activities. And with the new equipment I've, brought, I've bought, this start was very successful. Apart from my occupation as a publisher and journalist, I have been working since then on the full-time farm of my wife. Oh, wrong picture. So, um, on the full-time farm um, of my wife. She's a, a professional shepherd and keeps her sheep on more than 30 hectares grassland. Together, we have up to six German draft horses, Rhenish German draft horses, and I'm the one who is responsible for using them at preparing and maintaining the grassland, spreading manure, making hay and silage. Because 
most of the land is too far away from our homestead to reach it with the horses, we unfortunately have to have a tractor as well. We need it for the long distances on the road, but also for front loader work, work and for bailing. In what I call good horse years, the operating hours of the tractor are below 100 hours a year, and the horse team hours far more than 400. The recent years have seen a tremendous progress at the development of new horse-drawn machinery, not only in America, but also in Europe. Machines and implements of different types and sizes are available for almost every farm shop. I've been using machines both ground drive system, what means real horsepower, and motor assisted ones as well. In principle, however, it is quite possible to do almost every work with horses, uh, with real horsepower. If needed, you only have to hitch enough horses. Living on a farm with working horses in times of COVID-19 lockdown was a new experience for me. While most of the public life and economy around us was restricted or even stopped, life here went on and goes on as usual. Even if cars or tractors were banned, we always would have enough to eat, enough food for our animals, and we always can rely on a source of energy that works without diesel and petrol. This energy is renewable, good for the climate, and it and its use can be a pleasure and a benefit for both humans and animals. I'm more and more convinced now that we are on the right way and that gives me a really good feeling for the future. Thank you. Wow. Who knew? So, Who knew all that was going on? I was uh, reminded of, of a great deal of, of, of really interesting things that, that rang a lot of bells for me. But what I really want to know, Erhard, is do you think that farming with, with horses can really be sustainable and feasible, profitable in, in Europe today? Well, um, yeah, a working horse farm generally means a small farm. And small farming in Europe is rarely, rarely uh, profitable, unfortunately, regardless of whether using tractor or horses. Uh, this has to do with the agricultural policy of the EU and the subsidies. As long as agricultural subsidies are based on a per hectare payment, owners of small farms will be disadvantaged and cannot really compete. As soon as subsidies were based on the number of persons who are employed, for example, or on the environmental friendliness, or the biodiversity, or on the climate protection, the situation would change rapidly. But that needs a political decision, a general change in the policy. That farming with horses can be feasible and profitable. Even in high developed countries, the Amish in the United States have been showing for ages. Uh, they are said to belong to the best farmers in the world and they can compete very well with their tractor colleagues, not despite using horses, but because they do. Wow. Okay, so there's an opportunity there, isn't there, really, for us to explore, but it's not just about whether you use horses, it's the whole agricultural policy and the size of farms and everything that's being affected. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. So I guess maybe this is a good in, a chance to introduce Joao, um, who is the senior lead at welfare assessment in the donkey sanctuary. Hello, Ben. Hello there. And, and I know some of people may uh, know you, but I just wanted to introduce those uh, who don't, who, who um, Joao is a vet um, and focusing clinical activity on work in equids. And he attained a PhD in the field of donkey dentistry. But Joel has extensive experience with global uh, equids all over the world as a lecturer, tutor, practical assessor, um, um, animal welfare uh, worldwide. Um, but he's also 
the president of the Portuguese Association of Animal Traction since 2012 and the chairman of the European Draft Horse Federation since 2018 and developing vast uh, activity focused on the promotion of modern use of animal traction. And he's also got his own um, Zamorino donkeys and um, it, it does huge amounts of work, including vineyards and all sorts of things, just in his spare time, like all of these amazing people and, and what they're doing. So uh, maybe, Joe, you're going to talk to us a little bit about the role of the donkey and, and mule in all of this? Yes. First of all, thank you so much. Can you, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yep, we're good. Yeah, yep, we can perfect. hear you. Perfect. First of all, uh, thank you so much for, for this opportunity. Uh, I have to say that I cannot agree more with what Pete and, and Harriet say, both in terms of sustainability and in terms of the potential use of this, but I think it's a, it's a fair question. We, we see all these powerful horses uh, working around and we see, Herod mentioned some drill instinct that is a question of scale sometimes and you see this Amish community going up to 10, 12 horses with this, with this machinery. So I'll just like to share my screen and, and show some pictures. Uh, tell me when you can see it. It's working? Yeah, yeah you're good. Yep. So I think this is important, right? Where where's where donkeys and 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 mules can fit in in the middle of all this. Uh, this is some of the animals at home, as you can see, they're all there waiting for. It's incredible how they enjoy to work. And I have to say that, and this is part of the the, the working lines we, we we've been developing over this last year. But I think the most something really important is, and Pete Pete mentioned that mountain areas. I think mountain areas. That's David working with with Gallego, one of as a Moreno donkey. The video somewhere in this webinar look at this landscape and look at the size of these fields and imagine how difficult it can be to to farm in in in, in such conditions and this this is the reality of many mountain areas around the world europe is not a is not an exception there are many many small farmers who still live on a, on a subsistence base farming and closing the cycle and using the animals to work the land use the animals to produce their own food and the food for the animals so it's literally a a renewable energy. So this is this is a good place where donkeys, although they are smaller, and we know that donkeys can be very strong. And I'm fully convinced that uh, a 300 kilos donkey is probably more strong than a 300 kilos horse. Uh, but in, in such conditions, in such small farms, uh, donkeys can have a, a role. And if we look to France, for example, this is this is a very recent uh, book. It's called uh, Laine Marcher. It's very much donkeys working in, in, in gardens. And if you see these pictures and you see, for example, a Poitou donkey working with a modern cultivator from Vitimeca, this is, this is very, very interesting. This is a picture from a French web page. It's called L'Air de Pichelis. Uh, and Herod also mentioned something very interesting, that is he's working with German horses because it's a native breed. And what we see happening in Europe is that there's a role for these native breeds of donkeys. And because they have a role, people are still breeding them because they have a value. And this, the, the value of these animals as, work, as working animals, it's coming more and more. Some more examples here. Look, look the size of these 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 gardens, and look the the the, the line in between the plants where this small donkey can work. And we can see here good harness and good implements. Funny enough, this picture is from a French blog that says "Du tracteur à l'âne ou la prise de conscience politique du paysan." That mainly mainly basically means from tractor to the donkey or the political awareness of a peasant. So going back to what Harold was saying, apparently there is already a political awareness from the farmers, we now may need to have the politicians to have that same political awareness to bring this technology back. And look another example, especially in very small places like greenhouses, look the area and here donkeys, they may have uh, uh, an advantage because they need less space to work than, than these, these heavy horses. And I, I'm pretty much going to use the same examples as Pete. Uh, but probably showing the, uh, but only showing donkeys and mules. Look, this is this is a massive mule, of course. This is one of these French mules. But in in the vineyard world, animal traction is really reappearing again. Some pictures from one of the trainers, one of the workshops we did, and here we have draft horse on the right and a Zamorano donkey on the, on the left, working side by side. But the forest, in, in the forest as well, and of course we we have less power when working with these animals. But for example, this is a picture from the south of Spain where they use, you know, that one of the most important things of the southern Europe economy is the cork. And these mules, they work by their own and they help the cork producers to bring the, the cork from the mountain to the, to the 
to the loading area, it's very interesting. And some images, lo logging on a river with, with my donkey. This is me, uh, as, as Harold said, it's, it's, it's incredible the level of uh, um, the bond you can have with your animal. It's, we all know that donkeys are not the, huge, the best animals to be in the water and they're not the huge fans of water and you have logging with this animal inside the water. And what we need to do, and I think this is the future, is that we need to use technology and the technology is there and is available. Look, for example, the size of this log and it's absolutely impossible for this donkey to move this log. But if we use proper technology like logging vehicles, logging arches and proper harness, this is something we need to use. And this is actually something we've been developing. You, you saw those images that pick show about uh, the, 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 the forced trials, the use of pressure pads. And this is something we've been developing over the last two years. Just, just one more picture before, before jumping into the technology, urban environment as well. This is a picture uh, from this year, just before COVID in France, where they use donkeys to help in the daily management of the, of the cities. And this is very interesting. But going back to the technology, Ben, I was just saying, it's very important that we develop simple harness this is a perfect example this is a, a harness this by, designed by chris garrett our harness maker at the donkey sanctuary together with a good friend abel and they pretty much build a harness that is very cheap but the important part here is the design and this because as a good design this donkey was able to perform really well and we know that they perform well because we use for example in this case a swingle tree with a, with a load cell included where you can have similar graphs with those that Pete show. We even use thermal cameras to understand the contact areas with, with, a, with a harness and we even use these pressure pads. So uh, I think there's a role and I think there's, I'll just stop share my screen now. I think there's a role for all these animals. I think donkeys and mules, they still have a role uh, similar with the ones that, that Pete and Hera mentioned. We just need to make sure that somehow we follow the trend, we make sure that the working conditions, the health and welfare of these animals is, and, and their physiological limits and, and psychological limits are, are fully covered. And I think there's, there's, there's a role and the room for all these equities in, in, in modern society. I think, I think that is absolutely right. And amazing to see all those pictures mirroring the horse pictures that we've seen from Ehart and, and Pitt. And, uh, we do have a question, Joel, just uh, a technical one um, from Linda, who's asked, what's the recommended number of hours um, should a donkey work per day? Okay, that's, that's an excellent question. Thanks, Linda. And it's not an easy answer. It depends on the physical capacity of the animal. It depends on the age of the animals. As, as Harold mentioned, for example, he will not start working with an animal in the forest before four because there's a mental aspect that animals need to be prepared for that. Then physical, of course, it's, it's really important. If it's a light task, uh, if it's a light task, maybe with a couple of hours and you should start with that. And then if, it, if you are a professional, like, like Carol was working in the forest, five, six days a week, six, seven hours a day. So it's, it's pretty much, it's animals need to work the number of hours to, to achieve a certain task. But it's important that the people who work with animals know the limits, both physical and psychological limits, to make sure that we don't break an animal because that's something we don't, we, we don't want to happen. You know, it's animals, they like to work. They enjoy the fact that they spend their energy, but limits and, and it, it is a renewable energy if tomorrow the animal and ourselves are ready and, and fit to start working. So it's not easy. I'm not, I'm not trying to escape the answer, but it's, there are too many factors here that may may influence that i don't know if pete or her would like to to say something yeah Erhard is certainly more experienced uh, than than me Erhard, do you have a, 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 sort of a, me, a I, didn't, uh, I didn't understand <laughs> sorry how long would and, and i think joel has, has really yeah. captured this that obviously the answer is depends on on the age the fitness the work yeah. Nice, but but do you have kind of a figure in mind for your animals of, of how long is a a suitable working day for them? Quite, that's what I mentioned. Normally, normally the work is limited by my own condition, <laughs> <laughs> or was limited by my own condition. Uh, it it depends absolutely on the work. If you if you work with horses, for example, in the hillside, uh, it's uh, much more exhausting than uh, working in uh, in the plain area and if you if you have to uh, uh, to to hold timbers for long distances 
it's an, a completely different work if you if you work uh, on on short distances with a high frequency. Um, there are always breaks. There are always uh, uh, a tour where you where where the where the horse can walk without load, without pulling something. So there is enough time to to recover. And it's 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 really you you can't say. Um, in in my experience, it was six six hours. Uh, we normally work six uh, three hours in the morning and three hours in the in the afternoon, and had a break from one hour in the uh, at noon. So that was the normal situation. But, but what I'm sensing is that, that really we're also thinking about that bond that you've both mentioned with your animals and knowing the animal and knowing what's appropriate and suitable and, and because you care about that animal, never pushing it too far or doing too much, really. Yeah, if you, if you start with a young horse, for example, maybe half an hour is too much. Good. Okay, so it's really down to, to, to mit, matching it to the individual animal, which I think yeah. is... The brilliant response uh, that does kind of um make me think i've seen amazing pictures of modern uh, technology and and modern equipment and i was wondering uh, do you have some sort of air ideas of where people can um find out more about this or even locate that type of um machinery well what i really can recommend is visiting horse progress days in america or Pferdestalk in germany it's these are both really good occasions to meet producers and users and see a lot of different equipment implements and machines not only in display but also under realistic working conditions on the fields or in, or in the wood and uh, this is really a, a good chance to to uh, to get information furthermore uh, the different Working horse magazines are really a good source, of course, and they provide information on other meetings and events dealing with this issue. And some are even publishing test and practical reports on current and new develop, uh, developed uh, equipment. Um, and there is, of course, the internet. Um, I think uh, Joao uh, should uh, continue and uh, tell us something about the new uh, web project that uh, covers the answer to your question perfectly. Joao, what yeah. do you think? Yeah, yeah. Before that, I have to say that both horse, uh, the, the Horse Progress Days and Fat Stark is like Disneyland of animal traction. <laughs> For us who like that, it's literally like going to Disneyland. To be fair, I was writing those down. I'm thinking that's yeah, yeah. Do Man, this. Yeah. every All the machinery, because the, the best thing about these events is not only you see the manufacturers, you see the machines and you see on a daily basis, the demonstrations of those machines. So, you know, that's the, the, the way these events are organized. You can see all type of machinery, all type of demonstrations. And because they usually use the correct number of animals for each one of the machines, it also allows you to understand the, the, the power demand that you will need to each one of these tools, which is, which is great from a, from a buyer point of view. So, okay, this is too much for me because I only have one horse and we need to, to properly move this implement, we need three machines. But going back to what Harry was saying, I would like to use this opportunity to present a, a project that we develop. And when you say we, it's the Donkey Sanctuary, it's the fact to the European Federation of Draft Animals and World Horse Welfare. This is the web page. It's called equipower.org. And as you can see here, there's a specific section on manufacturers. And the idea behind this list of manufacturers was try to create a database. We, we know how important good harness and good implements are for the health and welfare of working equids. And we know the problems that new users or professionals or existing users may have. They, they will all face the same challenges that both Pete and Harold mentioned. They will start looking for all the equipment. It's very difficult to find spare pieces for those equipments. It's very difficult to find something that fits our animal. So we decided to create this database. So if you go to this webpage, equitpower.org, and if you go to the manufacturer sections, right now, we launched it very recently, just before COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and there's a list of 90 manufacturers, 90 manufacturers from more than 20 countries. And you can even filter, you can filter by country, you can filter by product, and you have the list of all these 
of all these manufacturers with web page or with a PDF, with a, with a booklet, the catalog. Uh, we have now, it's, it's a work in progress. So we thought that 90 manufacturers was a good number. We have now 30 more to add. And this, the, the last phase or the next phase of this proce process is going to try to give a voice to these very small manufacturers that they don't have a booklet, they don't have a web page. So we'll try to engage with them, hoping that they can send us pictures and they will be listed in this database as well. So it's, it's, it's a good way to empower these small manufacturers and it's a good way to put the big manufacturers and the small manufacturers at, at the same level and give the, the, the same level of respect they all deserve because they all do an amazing work. So this is, this is the web page. Wow, that, that's an amazing uh, resource to have all of that information on. And, and um, I think it's, it's so important that going forward, the right equipment's available, the, the right harness is available, because that's crucial to the welfare of the, the animals. And, and we do have a couple of questions um, that have come in. Uh, one from Judith. And again, I, I'm think, guessing this is going to be a similar answer to how long do we work our, our donkeys for, but how long do you think um, Earhart Pitt had to train a horse uh, to the sort of levels that we've seen in your pictures? <laughs> That depends on the horse. It's uh, horses are individual, and uh, sometimes there are horses they never will learn. <laughs> and uh, some with some you can uh, work on a professional base after one year. But uh, if you if you really uh, become familiar with the horse and and um, a very in intensive relationship. It, it, yeah, it, it depends on the frequency. How often you work with? That's that's what I mentioned. If if you are five or six days a week with one with a, with one animal on tour, uh, you get a very close uh, uh, feeling a relationship within no time. That could happen, yeah. but it's uh, it depends on the on the individual. Yeah, so, and, and it, uh, it depends on, on the trainer as well. If you know how to train <laughs> an animal, it's, it's, it might be easy. I know from experience, I had uh, draft horses uh, all my life and I, I trained some of them and uh, it, it went best, better uh, every time. That's normal. And then I switched to donkeys uh, three or four years ago, and it took me three years to understand how to manage these animals because I don't I don't know how they how they think and how they react. So it depends very much on the trainer as well how much uh, time it takes. <laughs> And the species, right? And uh, this is the perfect example that what we know about horses may not be valid for donkeys, and what we know about donkeys may not be valid for horses. Exactly. And when we jump to the next level, there is mules. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is. I think this is. I think this is the the good opportunity for for if you allow me to to announce that on the 15th of July, more or less in one month. The fact we'll organize a webinar and Ben will be our, our guest and the title of that uh, webinar is actually the key concepts for training a safe working equip and I, I hope Ben that all these questions will be covered because there are really too many factors uh, that will that we need we need to understand all this when, when we're talking about the number of hours for example the first thing that came to my mind if you work with horses with donkeys sorry donkey will tell you because that that <laughs> yeah. That wrong idea that they are stubborn is after all self preservance and they will say enough is enough and I will not work more for today. So I think we we'll cover all that in that webinar the 15th of July and we'll announce it properly soon. Yeah, no, definitely we'll, we'll, we'll cover that. And I think it's what's really interesting again is the expertise is saying it depends on the animal, the circumstances, the trainer. And I think that's what helps to really improve the welfare of the animal. There isn't a stock answer as you do this. It, it really is focused on what that individual uh, and the situation and what's needed, which is really important. Um, which kind of leads a little bit into Sarah asking, um, 
Is farming with horses, donkeys, mules, uh, growing in popula uh, popularity at this current time? I mean, it certainly looks like it to me from everything that you've shown, but what's your general opinion, gentlemen? Let's start with um, and Pitt, what do you think? For me, it, it's uh, quite difficult to give an answer to that question. I would, yes, uh, you should not take your wishes uh, for reality. Uh, so, yes, it is increasing, but it is not really... Uh, I, I always say we, it, it's like a, a, a plane, a, a, an aircraft that uh, is uh, departing. So you are running on the ground and take speed and speed and finally you lift up in the air. We are taking speed for 30 years now, but we are not uh, lifting in the air. Maybe even a little bit longer. I was sharing my father was working with heavy horses uh, about 50 years ago. So, yeah, we're taking a long run up on this runway, I think. <laughs> That's a long run up. We're lucky that it's not the end of. <laughs> if it was a short airport, it could be worse. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely do. but do, 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 uh, do you think that it, it, it is increasing your experience as a publisher and, and then the amount of uh, people looking for your magazine? Well, what I've seen is that there is a really a huge interest in, in workshops, in trainings, in uh, things like that. Uh, we are offering every year some trainings and it's, uh, they are always booked out. And um, I have, for, for example, tomorrow, I, it's the first, I, I'm going on tour for the first time after, lock, uh, after uh, lockdown. <laughs> And um, I'm going to Eastern Germany in an area where in a surrounding of 30, 40 kilometers, there are seven or eight uh, farms and gardeners who are working seriously with horses. And uh, I was really surprised because I didn't, uh, I haven't known everybody of them before. And uh, so um, I, I think many people uh, start working with horses on a hobby base as it's, a, it's fun. It's really, it could be really fun. And uh, some of them uh, do it, uh, make it to a profession like, like, yeah, like I did. Or I, yeah. Okay. So it does, it does seem to be, to be increasing, which is um, in various different aspects, which is fantastic to think of. And there's a question here that's just uh, come in from uh, Elena saying, how do you determine or decide how much weight they can pull? Joel, have you got some ideas for that? I'm guessing the idea might be depends. Yes, yes. You know, again, again, it's, it's because then there, there are many factors. That is, what is continuous pulling? versus an instant pulling you know if there is a log that is stuck in the mud and you need a powerful animal to pull as much as they can for those 10 seconds you know they can go very high in terms of force you know but then it needs to be a balance what you don't want is those animals to be in doing that for for long long time so it's 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 th that decision is based again on the type of animal the physical preparation these animals may have. Uh, th there's something very interesting. For example, when talking with farmers, there's something that all the knowledge of the soil, it was lost since you started working with tractors. You know what I mean? So you can plow, you can plow concrete if you want with a tractor. You can plow the road. Well, for example, when you see, when you see the traditional farmers using the animals, they know that they decide the effort that the animal is going to do based on the type of soil. So th there's a lot of, in all the factors that influence that and there was an intrinsic uh, feeling of the of the people to say this animal is able to do that or and if it's not they will not push you know it's it's the traditional farmers they used to have that type of of knowledge but yeah they can go very high in terms of power and i think the difference here we're talking about professionals or, or people working with every day who don't want to overreach their animal and exhaust them and wear them out yep. or, or cause yep. problems that are going to prevent them working the next day and those sorts of things as opposed to maybe yep. cultures or environments where economics doesn't allow yep. that level of thought <laughs> process um because because there's a question from tomorrow that says how do we ensure that the welfare of horses donkeys and mules is not affected during work in areas where there are no availability of proper equipment 
and also equids tend to be of a smaller size. And, and I'm thinking really that that's a lot about education it's a lot about the work of the donkey sanctuary in these areas it's a, it's a lot about trying to actually reach out in different ways to these communities and and to talk to them and to find solutions that um promote the the value of that animal and working it correctly so that it is sustainable for that animal yeah. rather than being a, a disposable commodity that we just get rid of at the, at the end of the season. So a lot of educational work needs to, to happen there. Would you agree, Joel? Yes, and uh, th there's a concept here that it's what is proper equipment. That picture that I show you, that color, that crease in the bell developed cost five euros. It's a, it's, a, it's a fan stick and the pillows are well designed. And for example, one of the critical points in Dunkis is the shoulder because it's not covered with muscle like in horses. So by designing a proper collar that avoids the shoulder and avoids a critical point, that became, even if it's only five euros, proper equipment. You know, and then it's going back to education in, in terms of how to look after the equipment, how to look after the animals, basic things, brushing the animals to eliminate the sweat and the dust from previous day will avoid the appearance of wounds. You know, so it's, it's all based on, on, on education and it's, Working with animals is not only putting a harness, say, and move forward. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of knowledge behind that, and that's why I respect so much these traditional farmers. And that's why Pete was saying that they were a source of inspiration for the new users back in the 90s because they they were a source of uh, knowledge that somehow it was lost. It was that that in many places that all that information was lost. Cool. Yeah, that's good. Um, a final question before we kind of just round up and finish up. And, and that a very technical question um, from Jamie here saying, are there parameters of land angle slope recommended for working equine? So, you know, is there something I'm guessing where it'd be too steep or um, again, are we in the common sense and it depends? Erhard, would you have a, a thought on that? Oh, I'm really sorry. I didn't. Under, I haven't understood. understood so the question is about the the slope, the angle of the land that you can work on with yeah. uh, an equine. Is there a particular, you know, that's too steep, or what would you think? Is there a specific, you know, above sixty percent is too steep a slope, or do you have an idea? I think um, it also depends on the work. Uh, for logging, for example, more than 60, 60 uh, degrees uh, steepness, it uh, becomes really, really dangerous. But as long as the horse can walk and stand, you can you can work there. But you have but it's, it's the most dangerous work uh, you can imagine. And you have that, that's that's uh, that's really a work only for very very professional uh, professionals. Uh, I think uh, a beginner or a starter won't survive. Yeah. <laughs> flat flat land, uh, flatter the better until you get really experienced for the animal and and the yeah. human as well. Yes, but, of course. If, if you can add some information there, I saw some very interesting numbers saying that, for example, with twenty percent on the way up, you double the weight of the log in case of logging. So that's, that's something important. And on the way down, for example, some species, if you work with eucalyptus, because the, the skin of the tree is not rough, with 35 degrees, you see the trees, as soon as you yeah. move them, they go faster than the horse. So that can create a lot of problems, you know? So, so usually with more than 40 degrees, people tend to not work what is called the erect pull. And then you need to start working with pulleys and ropes, the indirect techniques, you know, that, that increases a lot the time needed for each one of the operations. But just to keep this idea with 15, 20% on the way up, you already double the, the, the weight of the lock. So these are the typical things that you need to, to keep in mind when answering all these questions, how much weight they can pull. That's, as you can see, that is, it's plenty of factors that can influence. Okay, brilliant. That, that's a really good uh, summary of that. So I, I wanted to round this up and finish up. We, we've talked really nicely about where we've been and where we are now, but I wondered if you are able, each of you, just to give us a, a, a minute or so on where you think we're going with, equi with power in the next 30 years. You know, where, where we, would you like to see us and where do you think we'll be? 
um, for the 30 years time. Pitt, would you, would you like to kick us off? Uh, when people have the possibility to choose between motorized vehicles and machinery on the one hand and animal traction on the other hand, they will choose the first option with very few exceptions. So we know from experience that working animals are used where motorization is unknown, like in certain developing countries, or where motorized items or the needed fuels are not available anymore, for instance, in Cuba for the moment, or where motorized vehicles are banned, for instance, in the islands of Mackinac or in Juist uh, in Germany, or in Amish communities, or where the existing machinery has no access, for example, in logging operations in difficult terrain. So possibly natural disasters, armed conflicts, pandemics, or political evolutions will limit the use of engines to a certain extent and force people to a return to animal traction. Cuba is replacing thousands of tractors by oxen at the moment due to the limited import of fuel from Venezuela and to US American sanctions. This happened already in 1991 after the breakdown of the Soviet Union. But this kind of scenario is certainly not predictable. The use of animal power, as you saw it in our presentations, might grow and expand to a certain extent under certain conditions. This would mean a comprehensive system, including enough skilled people, trained horses, and modern equipment available at fair prices, a steady local or regional demand for horse-based production and services, a general exception of animals at work by the public and by decision makers, and finally, the inclusion in national or EU funding, like uh, Erhard uh, pointed out. Uh. That's good. Um, Erhard, would you have anything to add of your vision of the next 30 years? <laughs> At least for animal uh, traction, just maybe keep it to that. <laughs> well, I think my answer depends on whether I'm honest or just trying to express my wishes. <laughs> uh, being honest, I must say, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, everything seems possible. So many things happened the last years and even in the last months. Things, didn't, uh, things I didn't expect it and nobody could foresee. Uh, maybe the corona crisis leads to a new way of thinking, to more appreciation of regionality, to more support and promotion of small organic farms and small structures in general. I don't know. I hope so. From my person, uh, personal uh, point of view, I'm hopeful that we will have found in 30 years successes for our farm. And in 30 years, the next generation of our horses, of our current horses, will successfully continue the farm work using the latest modern technology and will also have found good jobs in the wood. Um, I can imagine that some of the young people who have participated in our courses have founded their own working horse enterprises be it in farming, market gardening, forest, tourism, or, uh, or working in the town. Hmm, that would be, be nice. Yeah, okay. That was kind of in between your, your dream and, and being honest. I like that. That was a good... Uh, Joel, for you? Well, uh, I know this is focused on Europe, but uh, you know that most of my work, it's, it's global. And I have to say that uh, 90 to 95 percent of the working equities in the world are in developing countries. And we know that these animals are facing huge challenges. We all know, or those who doesn't know, you can, you can check online, the huge problem that tankies all over the world are facing with, with the skin trade, uh, the, 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 illegal, the illegal trade of, of donkey skin. So I hope that if we continue to promote the correct use of animals, and if we find ways for these animals to still be functional and still help 
the, all these communities in all these developing countries. Uh, that's that's what I really would like to see, you know, because if, if things continue as they are with, with so many decision makers saying that animal traction is something from the past or is something from poor people and they still push the, the, the importation of uh, external production factors such as fuel or machinery in many African countries, as you see, that will create a, a massive wealth problem for these for this working activists. And I, I, I really believe they have a role and they have a, a place helping all these communities and improving the livelihood of all these people. So I really hope that in 30 years, when we'll do the, another webinar, uh, we can still say we can still say that there is a, a, a healthy population of working equities helping everyday people out there. That's that's my really my wish. We'll see. Yeah, I, I mean, to me, the fact that we're even doing this webinar on working equities is, is a progress and development, which I think is amazing, yes. and using the technology yeah. and, and spreading that. And I was thinking we'll probably be a holographic something in 30 years' time. This will seem like you know poor technology, but uh, I, I really think that. It's exciting to think about the future and how things in Europe could lead to other things around the world and improvement of animal welfare, which is crucial. Um, just before we finish, I just wonder if anybody got any more questions or thoughts or comments for um, these amazing um, speakers who I have to say for me has been truly fascinating to, to see the, the breadth and range of uh, animal traction and the, the development of equipment and the development of the animals. Um, so uh, it's been fascinating. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time to share everything with us. And um, I look forward to the 15th of July when we'll, we'll do a little bit more um, on uh, some of the training side and the Depends answers. 